Welcome to week one, unit one. My name is Rainer Zino, in charge of product management for business by design. And let me give you a short introduction on what business by design is actually all about. If we go to the first slide, then you will see here a short graphical representation of what it is. And uh, you will hear this term more often than once. By design is first and foremost a suite in the box. That is also the reason why you see here the key components like human resource management, financials, supplier management, project management, supply chain management, and customer relationship management. So these are the core building blocks of our suite in the box, business by design. In green at the bottom, uh, you see the topic of solution extensions. Solution extensions are absolutely key because most companies differ. They differ in regards to applications that need to be interfaced. They differ in regards to extensions that need to be built to meet their specific business requirements. And despite the fact that by design is a public cloud solution, each and every customer can have their own integrations, their own extension fields, additional business objects, and own logic. So you're not limited at all in the way how you want to run your business on business by design. So the important thing, it's a suite in the box, but it is open for integration and open for extensions. And that is also what you will see throughout this course more than once. Business by design is in the market since 2007, and I'm in the very pleasant situation that I have the opportunity from time to time to meet with customers who are using the system now for three, four, five, six years. Some customers even now for 10 years this year. And I use these discussions with these customers to ask them, well, now that you are so long using the system, what has it given you? What, what is the true tangible benefit that you got out of it? And the first thing that the customers say is they, they mostly say, we didn't know exactly what you were talking about when you first said sweet in the box, but the ability to grow our business processes, and many of them just started with financials or just started with CRM, and then over time grew into all the different areas without having the need to reinvent the wheel, to deploy additional solutions, to retrain all of the users, this is the value of the suite in the box approach. The second thing that the customers tell me, and I find this very interesting, they say the system actually made us smarter. And obviously, you would also ask the question, well, give me an example of what does smarter mean? And I recently met the CFO uh, of one of our large customers in the United States and Latin America. Uh, they are a wholesaler for, for air conditioning equipment, and he said, you wouldn't believe how many people come into my office and say, hey, we should invest more into this customer, into this product, or into this region. And in the past, he said, he mostly thought by himself, well, I hope that these people know what they are asking for. He says, since I have business by design, I bring up the profitability reporting by product, by customer, by region, and I see whether it's actually a good idea, whether I can back up that strategy by facts. And that makes me a lot smarter, makes me make the right decisions. So this topic of the insightful solution through the built-in analytics is a key capability and a key value. The third thing is that these customers mostly say, you know what, by design simply helped us to grow. Um, if When I meet with, with my friends from Skull Candy, um, they tell me, look, we are now for so many years on business by design and we are still on business by design. We bought business by design when we were a tiny company. We used business by design during the IPO. Now we are a huge company. Skull Candy is selling so many headphones, it's unbelievable. And all other outdoor sports equipment that people want to have, want to hear the music. So that really helped them to be a growth platform. And they also meet with other customers who have switched their ERP platforms a few times, and they are still on the same one. So you can grow with business by design. Last but not least, many of my customers say the, the best news is that 
you SAP now meet my obligations regarding innovation. You have the bandwidth, you have the people to look into machine learning. You can look into the Internet of Things scenario. You can look into big data scenarios for me and integrate that all in business by design and that is our value proposition or a big part of the value proposition to the customers. Whatever happens in the technology architecture business environment, we will monitor it and we will integrate these capabilities in business by design. I've already touched a little bit on the first slide on this topic of extensibility. When we set together around 2004 and thought about what shall by design be all about, we said it must be open, it must be extensible, it must be easy to deploy, and first and foremost, we wanted to empower the customer to do most of the adaptations on their own, especially in the mid-market. Business processes are never static. They are changing fast. It's not exactly every day, but pretty often companies say, hey, I can be a bit better. And then they need the ability to adjust the user interface, introduce additional analytical reports. And therefore, we drew this fan, which you can see here. In the past, 10 years ago, for everything you needed a consultant. In business by design, everything right up to the blue area, everything can be done by a key user. So whether it is business configuration, where you select the business processes which are key to you, everybody can personalize the screens the, the way they want to have it. You can add fields to the user interface. You can reshuffle the tiles to meet the specific requirements. You can say, sorry, this tile for me isn't relevant. Therefore, map it out. You don't need to have it. And very important, you can build own documentation into the system. You can adjust the forms that you are using. Um, maybe the management changes. Uh, you want to apply some changes there. You want to make it simply prettier. Super important, you can build custom analytics. Uh, I've given up decades ago to ever believe that a customer will look at a report that I provide and say, hey, Reiner, you got it right. Thanks a lot. I won't change anything. The typical reaction is you discuss a report with a customer. The customer says, yes, very nice, but. And we are prepared for the but. So you can easily take an existing report, add capabilities to it, add characteristics to it, rework it so that it meets your specific needs. You can add extension fields to the system. The by design data model is super rich. Nevertheless, many customers need specific additional fields which are not in the standard, but that's not a problem because you can extend them. And then you can use the SAP Cloud Application Studio. That is more for something with a, for the people with a programming background where you can now build extensions. You can build additional business objects, additional logic additional user interface. You can expose your new capabilities via web services. So that is the richness of the extensibility platform and obviously you can integrate by design because in 99% of all cases by design is not a standalone greenfield project. You have integrations into your banks, you have integrations maybe into your tax advisors, you have integrations into your payroll providers, you have integrations and you will hear more about that to your third party logistics provider. So that is why this fan is so important. Equally important to my customers is the value proposition of the global reach of business by design. What does that mean? For most companies, you could say, well, if you just serve the six largest countries worldwide, you can reach 75 of the world gross domestic product. But think of a company in the United States. They will most likely have a subsidiary also in Canada and maybe in Mexico or in other parts of Latin America or in Europe. So to just deliver a solution for North America would just not be good enough. Therefore, what SAP does is we deliver 19 country versions out of the box with business by design. In addition, we offer a number of countries as so-called pre-configured content. Pre-configured means, um, yes, you still need to do some adaptations to these country versions, which you see here at the bottom, like Algeria, Egypt, or Morocco. But 
it's easy, it's straightforward to activate these versions and go live also in these countries. In addition, we offer tax basic content for about 90 plus countries. Tax basic means we have some basic settings in the system for taxation codes, VAT, withholding tax, and so on and so on. All of this is available to you and your partners via dedicated toolkit. So you can also build out country versions which SAP does not support. That is also the reason why, and I checked it this morning, by design today is used in 123 countries. So it, is, it has a global reach and you can extend it as you go. If we now look at supply chain management, then I have here a simple visualization. You will hear more, a lot more about this in the next couple of weeks. So the first part is the internal supply chain. So that's the way how you organize the flow of goods within your company. Basically, uh, from the goods that you bring into your organization, put into the warehouse, from the warehouse uh, towards the production area, from the production area back to the loading dock, uh, where you then hand over these goods. So that is everything which you do in the internal supply chain. The second part of it is obviously you're the part of a bigger picture, which we describe as the external supply chain. So you have on the one side your customer and you need to understand the customer demand to do proper demand planning. And on the other side you have your suppliers from whom you source the goods which you need to contribute with your value add in the supply chain. So you use the intra-intercompany capabilities that Business by Design brings to the table. And when it comes to the shipping, and I already briefly touched on it during the integration part, you can use, for example, a third-party logistics provider. Many of my fast-growing customers said, why would I want to have a warehouse on my own and organize all of that? I can work with third-party logistics providers who can do this a lot better than I can, but it's fully integrated into my business by design system so that I have transparency. Last but not least, the key thing about supply chain management is that supply chain management is the other side of the coin on which you will find financials. Supply chain management and financials need to be tightly integrated because everything you do in your supply chain always has a financial impact. If you manufacture something, it has a financial impact. If you uh, revaluate something, it has a financial impact. That is the reason why since the first day, Business by Design contained a supply chain management kernel. Because the masterminds behind by Design said, you can't bolt on a supply chain management solution. It is nothing that you can solve with an add-on. You either put it into the solution in the very, in the very first second, or otherwise you won't get this linkage between financials and supply chain management. Let me show you one scaring slide. And it's not scaring at all. It is, it is uh, you know that business by design is a modeled system. And this is basically the look under the covers. So here in the middle, you actually find what I call supply chain management. Here you have the demand planning, you have the production, and it's exactly the same thing that you saw on the other side. Here you have the customer relationship management part, because otherwise the demand planning can't work here in the middle. And over here, you have your supplier relationship management, uh, down here, and that is only um, a little visualization, we have a huge wallpaper uh, which shows you the details of financials, which you have here, and here human capital management. I picked this slide simply to show you that everything that we do with supply chain management is at the center of what we do, and each of these black lines which you see here are available integration scenarios to you which we deliver out of the box. That much as a short introduction to business by design and what supply chain management will be able to do for you. Thanks a lot for your attention. And with that, I hand over to Stefan Rezak for the next unit. Hello and welcome to the second unit of week one. My name is Stefan Rezak and I will be your instructor for the rest of the week. In this unit 
I would like to provide you with an overview of the functional scope and the business scenarios we offer for companies dealing with tangible inventory managed products. As Rainer already mentioned in Unit 1, SAP Business by Design is a suite in a box and the major building blocks of the solution are depicted here. When we talk about supply chain businesses, in this course we want to consider the complete end-to-end -end processes and all the functional modules needed. Besides the pure supply chain related modules, we will therefore also consider the relevant aspects of sales, purchasing, financials and so forth. We will also have a look at processes like field service and repair. Finally, we will cover some aspects on how to extend the solution to customer specific needs to complete the picture. Let's have a closer look at the solution scope for supply chain management. First, it can be described from an end-to-end -end business scenario perspective. Overall, we offer 36 of these end-to-end -end scenarios. You can find an overview of all business scenarios in the official help documents. So what is a business scenario? It can be defined independently of any software system and describes all the steps or processes needed to fulfill a business need. Normally, multiple employees and departments of an organization are involved and not all the steps might be executed in the same software system. Some steps might even be executed outside a system. I've highlighted the three scenarios that I would call the main business scenarios, which are order to cash, make to stock and procure to pay. As an example, you see the processes that are part of the order to cash scenario, illustrated by the green chevrons. It covers all steps from generating sales demand, from customers to shipping the goods to the customer, and it also includes invoicing and the payment process. You can see that some of the steps are marked with the purple triangle, like processing receivables and payments, processing outbound deliveries or creating customer invoices. This means that these steps have relevance to finance and will lead to the corresponding accounting documents. You can also see that other business scenarios like customer returns or marketing to opportunity are linked to the order to cash process. The customer returns scenario, for example, starts with returning goods based on an outbound delivery that was created in the order to cash process. The second main scenario is the make to stock, which deals with manufacturing products to replenish inventory or to fulfill a specific sales order. Last, we have the procure to pay, taking care about buying products from your vendor. To run your business, you normally need several supporting scenarios. Demand planning, for example, will help you to forecast your future demand, so that production and procurement processes can already be triggered well in advance. With, material in, with materials in projects, we offer a solution that connects demand of inventory managed goods from your projects with your supply chain. Physical inventory management will help you synchronize the current stock levels with your system records. Just to mention a few supporting scenarios. You will learn more, a lot more about these and all other relevant scenarios in the upcoming weeks. Another way of looking at the solution scope of SAP Business by Design is from a functional perspective. Normally, a specific function is involved in multiple different business scenarios. For example, you will need the same warehouse management function goods issue in a normal order to cash scenario, as well as in the supplier return management. The functional blocks are also often closely related to the organizational units of a company. In blue, I highlighted the building blocks that are dedicated only to supply chain management related scenarios, 
like production, warehouse management and so forth. In contrast, the orange building blocks are also relevant for other scenarios. Sales functions, for example, are of course also needed when doing a pure service business. Let us have a closer look at some of the functional blocks. Sales and service covers the customer facing functions like order taking and invoicing. In supply chain design, you find functions to model the flow of goods to your customer between your locations or within your warehouse and production locations. The goal of supply planning and control is to come up with an executable plan on what quantities to produce and to procure when to fulfill the customer demand. Inventory valuation and product costing builds the bridge between quantities and the monetary world. And in finance, all supply chain transactions are recorded that have impact on profitability and the balance sheet. Let us now bring both the, the scenarios and functional view together. Taking the procure to pay business scenario as an example, you see that you can map the process steps to the individual functional building blocks. To fulfill the complete scenario, functions from supply planning and control, purchasing, warehouse management, quality assurance and finance are needed. In this course, we will mainly walk along the various business scenarios and highlight those functional aspects relevant for the respective scenarios. In addition, we will do deep dives for certain functions like available to promise, which is part of sales, and have a closer look at supporting concepts like serial number management or identified stock management. Now, where can you find the solution scope in the system? Let's have a look. In the Work Center Business configuration, we have the view Implementation Projects. Let's edit the project scope. In the first step of the guided activity, you can select the countries which are available in Business by Design. Let me skip the next step and directly navigate to the scoping. On the left hand side, you can find a hierarchy of scoping elements. They are grouped by functions, so you see scoping elements for sales, for service, for purchasing and so forth. And of course you also see the supply chain related scoping elements for supply chain planning and control, manufacturing and so forth. Let's have a look at the supply chain setup management. I expand the hierarchy and now look at the execution design. You see there is only the third party logistics scoping element which I can deselect. But why can't I deselect the warehouse and production layout? Let's have a look at the dependencies of this scoping element. You see that this warehouse and production layout scoping element was switched on automatically because, for example, we have selected production. Of course, it doesn't make sense to produce but not take care about the production layout. By these dependencies, the system ensures that you can only consistently select a scope and thus our business uh, scenarios end-to-end -end run smoothly. Let me return to the slides. Besides the scenario and functional scope, let me show you some of the solution principles we follow when designing the solution. First, we want to consider the complete multi-level supply chain of a multi-company business in one tenant. Nowadays, even mid-sized enterprises have multiple companies in various countries. With that, you have a high visibility of the complete demand and supply situation 
across all locations. It is also very easy to model intercompany business by using the out-of-the-box intercompany integration. This even works across tenants using B2B integrations. As already mentioned before, we have a tight integration into the value chain. This allows you to have real-time cost transparency, up-to-date inventory values and every relevant supply chain activity is directly visible in financials. Another aspect is work efficiency. In the open SAP course on Business by Design Financials, you have already learned that work is pushed to the user. In supply chain management, we offer a concept to automatically distribute work to the shop floor and the warehouse workers, supported by a uniform task execution process. Process automation is also key in a high volume business. Therefore, we offer a broad set of mass data runs, like for demand planning, material requirements planning, or to release business documents automatically to the next processing step. Furthermore, we will find exception-based planning and execution monitoring capabilities. Finally, the solution helps you to leverage the ecosystem. There are other parties involved like shipping service or warehouse providers, and here we offer out-of-the-box integration. You can also use multiple interfaces to other solutions like web services that help you to integrate to external solutions like an eShop or a CAD system. You can also adapt the solution in various ways. One is by using the Cloud Application Studio. This is a built-in software development kit. You can also use SAP's Cloud Platform to create side-by-side -side applications that can integrate with SAP Business by Design. Examples could be an Internet of Things application that collects data and triggers field service requests in the system. Our partner, Ecosystem, can help you to leverage these adaptation capabilities. Now let us summarize Unit 2 of Week 1. You got an overview of the business scenarios and the functional scope SAP Business by Design covers for supply chain management related businesses. I also showed you how you can easily change the solution scope in a consistent way. Finally, I've highlighted the solution principles we follow. See you in the next unit. Hello and welcome to week 1, unit 3. In this unit, I will show you how to model your enterprise with respect to supply chain processes. In addition, you will get an understanding of the concept of materials and services and what data you need to maintain. The slide illustrates a supply chain related view of your own enterprise. This often consists of multiple companies. In our example, the enterprise consists of two companies in the United States, called Almica and Innovat. Entities belonging to Almica are highlighted in orange. Innovat is highlighted in green. A company is a legally independent entity registered in one country. Therefore, most enterprises have at least one company per country in which they do business. Our company Almica is present in four different locations, marked with the orange boxes. There is a headquarter in one location. Another location hosts the sales department, production and warehouse. And there are two other locations hosting warehouses. Usually, these locations need to be modeled in a business software because you need to identify them in your business processes. In SAP Business by Design, we call these business residences. Our company Almica, therefore, has four business residences. Our second company, Innovat, only consists of one business residence, since headquarter, warehouse and sales are in one location. Let us see how this is modeled in our solution. 
the company's internal legal, financials, functional and location aspects are all captured in a central organizational management structure in the system. This is mainly a hierarchy structured of organizational units. I will also use the term org unit instead. Besides some administrative information like the name and the manager of the org unit, you need to specify what the org unit is and what the org unit does. We specify what an org unit is by so-called definitions. These could be cost center, reporting line unit and of course also company and business residence, which are the two most important definitions for supply chain management processes. A central concept in SAP Business by Design is that org, uh, one org unit can have multiple definitions in parallel. So it could be a business residence and a cost center. Whenever you define an org unit as business residence, the system automatically creates a site. This is the logistics representation of a business residence and it is used in supply chain processes. Next, we need to specify what an org unit does. This is done by functions. The functions help to integrate an org unit into the business processes. With org unit functions, you can, for example, make an org unit a sales organization, a sales unit or a purchasing unit. Again, you can assign multiple functions to the same org unit and even assign multiple definitions and functions in parallel. In the hierarchy on the right, you see an example of how an organizational structure could look like. The orange color represents org unit definitions and the green color represents functions. Below the org unit holding, there are two companies and below the companies, we find several business residences specified by setting the corresponding org unit definition. One of the business residences has also the function of a sales org. Thus, it's orange and green. We also have two org units that have no definitions, but the function sales org and sales unit assigned to it. Let's have a look at the system. In the work center organizational management, you can find the org structures. You see three org units, which is the holding and Almica and Innovat. Let me select Almica and look at the definitions tab. Here you see that it is marked as a company. Let me expand Almica further. Below Almica, we have for example Almica Heating Cleveland. And from the definitions tab you see that it's marked as a business residence. And also you see that a site is associated to it which was automatically created. Now let me expand Almica even further. Below Almica Heating Cleveland we for example see a unit called Sales Heating. It is neither a company nor a business residence. Now let's have a look at the functions. You see that it has the function Sales Organization assigned to it. We can do sales, marketing and also customer invoicing in that unit. Let me return to the slides. Let us now move to another very important question. Every enterprise needs to think about what kind of things is needed to deal with in their sell, buy and make business processes. One way to distinguish these things is if they are tangible or intangible in nature. Materials are certainly tangible things. We can further group them related to their role in the business. The first group of materials is everything from a raw material or a component through intermediate products like assemblies up to finished products that are then sold to our customers. 
these materials circulate in our supply chain. These supply chain materials will be the focus of our course. I will also often use the term goods or products instead of materials. The other materials are things like office material or consumables that are needed to run operations. Supply chain processes normally do not play a major role for these kind of materials. Next are fixed assets. These can be tangible, like notebooks or machines for production, or of intangible nature, like software. The other group of intangible things are the services, like inspections or consulting. Maybe a company is selling machines to customers and offers inspection or repair services to keep them running. Let me now focus on some of the key characteristics of the different types of tangible things. In the picture you see all three of them. First, we have the supply chain materials here in a high rack. They are constantly purchased, consumed in production, created in production or sent to the customers. Normally businesses deal with a huge number of different materials. Quantities and locations of these materials change daily and need to be kept up to date in a software system. We also say that these type of materials are inventory managed. Another important aspect is that the value of these materials correspond to the quantity on stock. Thus, the stock levels have their correspondence in the material ledger of financials. The man in the picture uses a pen <coughs> and some paper to take notes. These are typical examples of materials that are needed to run operations. However, from a software perspective, you normally don't need to know how many of the, these materials are there and where they are located. They are not inventory managed. From a financial perspective, they are only considered as costs for the company. Now, look at the forklift. Like the office supply, it is something that is needed to run operations. However, in contrast to pen and paper, it is of much higher value. And the value changes over time. An old forklift surely has a lower value than a brand new one. To reflect this, materials like forklifts are managed in a so-called fixed asset inventory. And depreciation methods are applied to reflect the correct asset value in the balance sheet. Now let's have a look at how these supply chain materials are set up in the system. In the work center, product data, we have a view materials. In that view, you find all the supply chain managed materials. Let's select a specific material. and create a copy of it and I copy it with source statuses so it will already be activated for the various aspects. First of all I have to give it an ID. This ID is used to identify this material in the various business processes. You can so also see that the material is assigned to a product category this product category helps to group similar materials, for example, for financial or purchasing purposes. You also see that this material is managed in eaches, which is the unit of measure. Now down here you find a table of quantity conversions. So if you want to manage your material for certain processes in other units of measure, you have to specify the quantity conversion here. For example, if you want to sell this material in boxes, you can specify how many eaches are in one box. With that, you can now use the unit of measure boxes instead of eaches for this material. 
Let's move along the various aspects of the material. In the purchasing, you just simply activate it so that you can buy it. In the logistics tab, this activation is done per site. So you can specify per site if you want to do production or warehouse management operations for this mater material. You also can find a so-called production group and a storage group, which can be specified per site. This storage group and production group helps you to group similar uh, materials for inventory management and production purposes. For example, I can assign the storage group non-bulk material to it. It's handled in EGIS and truly not a bulk material. If I want to do supply planning and forecasting, I can activate the material per planning area, which is not nothing else than the site. If I want to check the availability for a certain site during the sales order process, I can activate the material. I can also specify how the availability is checked with the availability check scope. For example, I can, could say that I only want to consider stock. If I want to sell that product, I have to activate the product per sales organization. You remember that the sales organization was a function that could be set in the organizational management, which means that first you have to set up an org unit with the function sales organization before you can sell a product. Last but not least, we have the valuation tab. Here we define how one each of the good translates into money. This is done per business residence and per set of books. In our example, one each of the product is 100 US dollars. Let me close the material without saving. Let me also now show you where I can define the, certain, the various groups I've just shown you. For example, we have groups for forecasting, for planning, production and storage. Let's select the storage group. You remember that I have assigned the storage group non-bulk to our material. We have also defined another storage group bulk. You will later on learn a use case how, how the storage group can influence the processes. Let me return to the slides. This concludes unit three of our first week. In this unit, we introduced the organizational management and discussed the key organizational unit definitions and functions needed for supply chain management. Then we had to look into what materials, services and assets are and how to set up a material for supply chain management. Finally, I've shown you how products can be grouped together for different purposes. I hope you have enjoyed this unit. See you in the next unit. Hello and welcome to week one, unit four. In the last unit, we are focused on our own company. Now we will have a closer look at external parties involved in the supply chain. First, there are of course customers and suppliers that we do business with. But there are other parties involved. Maybe one of our warehouses might be operated by a third-party logistics service provider or called 3PL. We also might use a freight forwarder to ship the goods to the customer. There might also be external staff executing services on behalf of your company. So how is this reflected in SAP Business by Design? All parties you interact with are first represented by an entity called business partner. This can be a business partner person or a business partner organization. A business partner person could be a customer, 
for example in a consumer business, I will also use the term account instead of customer. Another example is a service agent, which is a person not employed in your company but working for your company. Business partner organizations could for example be suppliers, but in a B2B type of business also again accounts. Here the account represents a company that buys goods from your company. In the system, each business partner only needs to be created once and then you can assign multiple roles to it. Of course, these roles can differ if the business partner is a person or an organization. A person could be an account and a service agent at the same point in time. A business partner organization can be a supplier and at the same time an account of your company. Some of the roles are grouped together. A special type of supplier is the warehouse provider, running your warehouse on your behalf in a 3PL scenario. Other supplier roles are freight forwarder or bidder. You can also maintain relationships between business partners, here highlighted with an arrow. A service agent, for example, could be employed at one of your suppliers. Also, business partner persons could be contact persons at your supplier or account. As you might remember, our enterprise consists of two companies called Almica and Innovat. Since these companies are legally independent companies, they also act as an account and supplier for each other. To reflect this, the system automatically creates a business partner with a role supplier and account for every company and the organizational management. Consequently, when transferring goods from Almica to Innovat, Almica acts as a supplier for Innovat and Innovat acts as a customer for Almica. In week 4, we will have a closer look at this intercompany sell and buy process, sometimes also called intercompany stock transfer. Sometimes there are situations where you cannot model all companies of an enterprise within the same tenant. Or maybe you run a two-tier ERP strategy and your headquarter uses S4HANA and your subsidiaries run SAP Business by Design. In those cases, you first need to set up those companies as supplier or account business partners. In addition, you need to create a partner company for those supplier and customer business partners. This is needed for financial reporting purposes, so that you can distinguish between external and intercompany business. All companies modeled in the organizational management org structure are automatically partner companies. Let me now show you where to find the business partner related work centers and how to create partner companies. In the work center business partner data, there is a view business partners. Here you can find all the business partners created in Business by Design. Already here you see a business partner for Almica, our company. Let me open the advanced filter and have a look at the value help of the business partner roles. You see a long list of available roles in Business by Design. Of course, roles like supplier and account are here. Let me select the accounts. And here you see again Almica and Innovat, our companies, also as the uh, account business partner, but many others. Imagine now we have a company, Low Plumbing, which is our account, but now we decided that it's also to buy things, so he also acts as a supplier for us. We select this and now can create it as supplier. Already some data are pre-filled from the account business partner data, but you can also add additional purchasing related data like the payment terms or the purchase order currency. 
We also see some additional identifiers which assign further supplier roles to this business partner, like bidder, freight forwarder or warehouse provider. Let me close this without saving. Now the other use case was that maybe we work together with a headquarter. Let's assume business partner HP Sweden is our headquarter. And you see, we've already created business partner data for it. Now, I need to create a partner company for this. This can be done in the General Ledger Work Center in the view Partner Companies. Here again you see that Almica and Innovat, our two companies, are already partner companies. Let me create a new partner company. And select our business partner HPA Sweden. I can also specify the date from which this business partner is affiliated to us as a company. Let's choose 1st of August. Now financial reporting will recognize transactions with this business partner as intercompany transactions. Let me again close without say, saving and return to the slides. Now that you've understood how business partners are modeled, let us have a closer look at what we call a distribution network. Our company Almica has three warehouses from where goods can be shipped to the customers. You can see them highlighted with A, B and C. To save transportation costs and to shorten delivery lead times, it makes sense to ship the goods from the nearest warehouse to the customer. So, Whenever a customer is in one of the orange-colored states, he would be delivered from warehouse A. The light gray states would be delivered from B and the dark gray states would be delivered from C. These types of normal shipments are marked with a blue arrow. Of course, there could be exceptions to this assignment. There might be customers in a dark gray state which get their goods from warehouse A. See the green arrow in our example. Also, some goods might only be available in warehouse C and thus always need to be shipped from there. I've highlighted this with the red arrow. Sometimes you first distribute the goods from a production site to a warehouse before it is shipped to the customer. This is represented by the black arrows. This process is also known as intracompany stock transfer because the stock is transferred between two sides of the same company. Maybe a supplier directly sends goods to customers on our behalf. See the orange arrow. This process is also called third-party order processing or drop shipment. We will cover this in detail in week 4. To address the various use cases, we have just seen we mainly offer two objects, the transport zone and the transport lane. The role of the transport zone is to group customers that should get their goods from the same site. So if two customers belong to the same transport zone and they order the same product, then they should be delivered from the same site. The transport zone can either be defined by a list or a range of countries, regions or postal codes or, alternatively, a transport zone could also be set up directly as a list of customers. In our example, we, do, we would define three transport zones to group the orange, light grey and dark grey states. A global transport zone is pre-delivered in the system and you can use it if a separation of your customers by transport zones is not needed. Now let's talk about the transport lanes. You can use them to define which goods can be shipped within a certain time from a specific site to a specific transport zone. Let me explain what steps are taken by the system when a sales order for a supply chain material is entered. In step 1, the system determines the transport zones. This is either done by checking if the account is directly assigned to a transport zone 
or if it fits into a transport zone based on the ship to address in the sales order items. There could also be multiple transport zones a sales order item fits into. In a second step, all lanes are re-evaluated that are directed from a site to the just determined transport zone. In step 3, it is checked if the material requested by the customer can be transported with this lane. Of course, the relevant logistics master data for material need to be available for the site. See step 4. If there are still multiple potential ship from sites, you can prioritize the transport lane that should be automatically considered. You can still change the ship from site proposed by the system manually if needed. You remember that sometimes goods need to be distributed from a production site to a warehouse site of the same company. This is the second use case for transport lanes. Here they are defined between two sites. Again, allowed products and shipment duration can be specified. You will learn more about this intra-company stock transfer use case in week 4. Now let me show you how to set up zones and lanes in the system. In the Work Center Supply Chain Design Master Data, you can find two views, which is the Transport Zones and the Transport Lanes view. Let's first select the Transport Zones. You see already the Global Transport Zone pre-delivered. Imagine now we want to do new business in California. Therefore, we would first create a new transport zone for California. Let's call it, call it California. And here, down, we can assign the region to this transport zone. Of course, again, we would use California. Next, we need to determine from which site we want to ship goods to this new transport zone, California. This can be done by creating a new transport lane. Here you see on the right that we can specify the transport zone for this lane, which means that this lane can now be used to ship goods to California. I now have to enter the ship from site as well. Let's assume we want to ship our goods from Almeca Heating Cleveland to California. You can also specify a shipment duration. Here it is one day. Down here you can also specify the allowed products. I want to allow to ship every product via this lane. If you want to have a stock transfer process, an intra-company, intra instead of a transport zone, you would specify the ship to site. Let me close the screen without saving. Let me summarize what we've learned in Unit 4. I've shown you the different business partners in a supply chain environment and how they are modeled using types and roles. I've also explained the relationship between the organizational management, especially the company and the business partner, and have introduced the partner-company concept. Finally, I've shown you transport zones and lanes to model your distribution network. See you in the next unit. Hello and welcome to Unit 5, our last unit of the first week. In Unit 4, I told you how the external supply chain can be set up. In this unit, I will focus on the follow flow of materials within a site. Let me call it the internal supply chain. Here, I have given examples of typical material movements within a site. In Step 1, 
a truck arrives at the warehouse and goods need to be unloaded and checked. Next, in step 2, they are put away into the high rack area of the warehouse. Also, components need to be replenished from warehouse to the production area and finished goods need to be put back into the warehouse or to a picking area. See steps 3 and 4. Before the products are shipped to the customer, they need to be picked from the warehouse and loaded onto a truck, marked as step 5 and 6. There are other material movements needed, not shown in the graphics, for example, to optimize space in a warehouse. One of the tasks in a software implementation project is to decide how sophisticated the modeling of your internal material flow needs to be. There are questions to be answered, such as to what degree do I need to automate processes and how do I gain efficiency? How many system controls do I put in place to avoid human errors? And finally, what level of transparency is required to optimize my processes? There is no right or wrong in how detailed the modeling should be. The business requirements could also change over time and you might start with a simpler approach like the one shown on the left with only one area for warehouse and one for production. Later, once your business grows, you might need to model your high racks and receiving and shipping areas, as you can see on the right. In SAP Business by Design, we address these flexible modeling requirements with what we call the location layout and the logistics model. Let us have a look at the location layout first. To create a location layout, you first need a storage location. This could either be the site itself, marked as a storage location, or you can create storage locations below a site. The idea of the location layout is to model the physical areas of a warehouse and production location. The layout itself consists of a hierarchy of so-called logistics area, in short, LOAS. These are freely definable areas within the location, providing detailed physical and operational information. If you are interested in knowing the inventory levels of goods already unloaded but not put away, then you should have a goods receipt area. If you want the system to guide your warehouse workers to the right bin location, then you should model your high rack area down to the bin level. If you have a rather simple warehouse and workers know where to find the goods, your modeling could be more simple. The site could also consist of several production areas in which production resources are located. There could also be dedicated logistics areas to supply components to production lines. With that, you can see the flow of materials through production. Please note that inventory management is only enabled for the green logistics areas. In fact, it can only be enabled for one level of the hierarchy. Once for a logistics area the inventory managed indicator is set, you will be able to store products there. Let us have a first look in the system. In the WorkCenter Supply Chain Design Master Data, we have a view locations. In that view, you can see all the sites which got created based on the business residences of organizational management. Here we also have a site, Almica Heating Cleveland. Let's first have a look at the site itself. Here we can find data like the address of the site and we can also have, uh, we have information like the time zone the site is in or the site calendar. On the right, you find further roles of this site. It can be used as a ship from location or as a ship to location, but also you see that it's marked as a storage location. This means we can create a layout for it. Let's have a look at the layout itself. Here in the table, you see the hierarchy of logistics areas. You, for example, 
see a logistics area for bulk, bulk storage, you see a simple warehouse and you see a high rigged area which has a structure below it. You see that the high rack area is modeled down to the bin level. Let's select the first bin for now and see what data can be maintained. I will not show each and every data but only focus on the most important aspects for now. First you see that we have the inventory managed indicator activated. That means you can store products on this logistics area. Another very important parameter is the logistics use. This logistics use defines how this logistics area is used in the logistics processes. Here it's used for storage, but you can also assign further logistics usages to it. For example, it could be used for shipping staging or for receiving staging if I assign additional logistics usages for it. Let me remove, remove that line for now. Now let's have a look. Oh, um, also, we can define certain restrictions of this logistics area. You can, for example, define that only the same product is stored at one point in time. You cannot mix products in that bin. You can also define which products are allowed to be stored there. In this example, on that bin, I can only store handsets. Now let's move to the production. Here we have a list of resources which are assigned to the production area. These are production machines, for example, that are used in manufacturing. You can also see a fixed supply and output area. With this supply and output area, these are again logistics areas, which are then used in manufacturing. In the, the fixed supply area is used to pick the goods from there to fulfill a production order. After production, the goods are stored in the output area, here in the warehouse. So let's have a look at this, this production supply area. It can be found below the production logistics area. Let me select it. It's again inventory managed. And we have so-called replenishment and removal rules. Here only the replenishment rules are maintained. So what do these rules do? They define when goods need to be brought from the warehouse to this production supply area. In this example, it's demand-based replenishment type, which means that only goods are brought to the production supply area when we have open production orders. I will skip the material flow rules for now and return to the presentation. The other master data to control the internal material flow is the logistics model. It describes the steps of operations of a logistics process. We offer different logistics models for the standard receiving and shipping, replenishment and removal, returns and spare parts process. In a lot of cases, a logistics model consists of one operation, but there are logistics models that can have two steps like for shipping of goods to customers. See the example one on the slide. Let's have a closer look at this model. In a first step, we pick the goods from a warehouse and bring it to a shipping staging area. And in a second step, the goods are loaded onto a truck. For each step of the logistics model, you must define the logistics use of the source and destination logistics area. This is needed for the system to automatically propose logistics areas when tasks for the warehouse workers are created. Of course, only logistics areas that are inventory managed and have the correct logistics use are uh, and have the correct logistics use assigned can be proposed. In our shipping example, the goods should be picked from a logistics area with logistics use storage. 
The goods should then be brought to a logistics area with use shipping staging. In the load step, the goods of course are taken from source logistics area of use shipping staging, but the target logistics use is not defined because the goods are not in our warehouse anymore after loading. Now to the second example. For a replenishment task, you remember that the replenishment rules were defined for the target logistics area. Therefore, the target logistics use does not have to be defined in the logistics model. Nevertheless, you'll need to define the source logistics use. There is one element missing. We still need rules that help the system to determine the specific source and destination logistics area. Imagine you have set up a location layout with multiple logistics areas of the same logistics use, for example storage. Which of the logistics areas should the system propose? You can define this in the material flow rules. They can be set up on site level and on any hierarchy of the logistics area. The system always tries to use the most specific set of rules. Let us take a first example, a shipping process. In the one-step process, the goods will leave our warehouse after picking. <coughs> Sorry. Therefore, the system will always consider the material flow rules on site level. Let us look at the second example. In the replenishment process, we learned that the rules are defined for the target logistics area. Thus, the system will first check if any material flow rules are maintained for this logistics area. If no rules are maintained, the system will go up the hierarchy of logistics areas until it finds some rules up to the site. If no material flow, uh, flow rules are defined at all, the system will apply default rules. Let us once more go to the system. In the warehouse, Warehousing and Logistics Master Data Work Center, we have the view Logistics Models. Let me open the Logistics Models for standard shipping. You see that this Logistics Model has only one operation, which is the shipping pick operation. Let's select the operation and look at the source and destination logistics use. You see that the source logistics use is maintained as storage. This means when picking goods to ship to the customers, the system will automatically propose logistics areas with the source logistics use storage. The asset, the destination logistics use, is not, not specified because after one step picking, the goods have left our warehouse. Now let me show you where you can find the material flow rules. Again, I go to the supply chain master data, work center, view locations. As you've already seen before, the material flow rules were on logistics area level, but also I told you that they could be maintained for a site. You can find them in the site UI on the top material flow. You can either define basic rules. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong uh, site. Let me select another one. You can have first of all basic rules. This is nothing less than a fixed source and destination logistics area. These rules might be sufficient if you have a very simple layout. If you have a more advanced layout, we can define advanced rules. First of all, we have a sequence ID. You see that the sequence ID is specific for a certain logistics area use. Here's storage. So this means this sequence ID will be used for our one-step shipping process. Down here you see uh, a sequence of steps which are taken 
to look for inventory. First, the system will look in the warehouse for goods. It will use a picking strategy, Pfeiffer, which is first in, first out, meaning that the goods are picked from the warehouse, which first entered the warehouse. If no inventory can be found in the warehouse, the system will look at the high rack area, again using a Pfeiffer picking strategy. Now imagine we have another area. You remember we had the bulk area and I want to use this for picking the goods in the outbound process. So how do I do this? First, I define a new sequence ID. Let's call it bulk. And again, since I want to use this in the picking process, I assign the logistics area use storage to it. Now, down here I can define from where to pick the goods. And since this is bulk material, I will use the bulk storage and in this case just a minimum movement because I want the warehouse workers to have as, as few tasks as possible. Let me save this. But still the system doesn't know which sequence ID has to be used when. This can be specified in the sequence determination. Let me add one row. And here I first select the sequence ID. Let's first use the sequence ID which I want to use for non-bulk material. And I assign the storage group to it. You remember this storage group could be assigned in the material master data on the logistics tab. And I assign the non-bulk storage group. And for the other sequence ID bulk, I assign the storage group bulk. Now the system first checks the storage group of the product and with that it will determine the sequence ID which is used. Let me save and close this and return to the slides. This concludes Unit 5, our last unit of Week 1, where we have had a look at the various location definitions and how to model the internal structure of a site using the location layout. We also have understood the role of the logistics model and the interaction with the location layout. Finally, I introduced material flow rules. I hope you'll enjoy the course. My colleagues and I would be happy to see you in the next week.